sort of denotes that it, it may it may be cancer. That's what the way he put it. Maybe uh, the radiologist and he were not willing to say it was, and it's too early to go in with a needle and do a biopsy because on the coming in I could be <coughs> death. And then if I took me off, if he took me off the coming in for ten days, then the whole process of blood clotting in my legs could cause the whole thing over. So I liked his solution. Wait till February. We'll take another test. <laughs> I think that's in control. I mean, I think. Shame on <laughs> I know mine is in control. And uh, so I'm going to trust him. That's the way we'll treat it. <clears throat> Just pray for the doctor's wisdom. Amen. Others? Yes, Dr.
2.26 through 3.6. If you're ready for the Word of God, please say Amen. 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 Please stand out, stand out, respect the reading of the Gospel of the Word. Revelation 2.26 says, And he who overcomes and keeps my works until the end to him, I will give power over the nations. He shall rule them with a rod of iron, and they shall be dashed to pieces like the potters of the potters vessels, as I have received from my Father. And I will give him the morning star. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Chapter 3. And to the angel of the church in Sardis write, These things says he who has the seven spirits of God and the seven stars. I know your works, that you have a name, that you are alive, but you are dead. Be watchful and strengthen the things which remain that are ready to die, for I have not found your works perfect before God. Remember, therefore, how you have received and heard, hold fast and repent. Therefore, if you will not watch, I will come upon you as a thief, and you will not know what hour I will come upon you. You have a few names, even in Sardis, who have not defiled their garments, and they shall walk with me in white, for they are worthy. He who overcomes shall be clothed in white garments, and I will not blot out his name from the book of life, but I will confess his name before my Father and before his angels. He who has an ear, let him hear, hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Thank you. So, the, uh, the final element in the letter to the church at Thyatira is its counsel that begins there in the second chapter, 26th verse. And it says, to he who overcomes and keeps my works until the end. Christ makes two promises to those individuals. We, we're, we know who the overcomers are, the believers. First, he says, he will give them power over the nations, and he shall rule. And then he makes a reference to the, uh, it's uh, the second Psalm, verses 7 through 9. So, he'll give them power over the nations. He shall rule them with a rod of iron. They shall be dashed to pieces like the potter's vessels. That's a promise of believers' participation in the millennial kingdom. Okay? And uh, that's one of the things that Jesus promises the overcomers. We are those overcomers uh, also. Uh, these are those that remain faithful to Jesus, that they will reign with him in his earthly kingdom. Uh, and those kingdoms <coughs> during that time which rebel against Jesus will be, uh, will be destroyed. Will be kingdoms, active nations that will come against Christ in, in, in those times. Those that will rule with Christ, us, will be ruling for our purpose, will be to promote holiness and righteousness. And Christ will delegate authority to them. Christ says, as I also have received from my Father. Quite a, uh, quite a uh, endorsement second promise is that Christ will give these faithful followers, it says, the morning star. And the morning star, some will connect that morning star to uh, Daniel 12.3 and Matthew 13.3. And if you do that, if that's your desire, you would, uh, that promise then would be then that believers will reflect Christ's glory. And that is a, that's a truthful statement, so I'm not necessarily adverse to that, to that conjecture. Uh, Christians will reflect Christ's glory, but I believe that it's better to see the morning star here as Christ himself, yes. which is a title that he assumes in Revelation 22, uh, 16, I believe it is. Christ promised believers himself in all his fullness, the one whom we, as it says in 1 Corinthians 13, 12, it says, now we see in a mirror dimly, but then, face to face, now I know in part, but then I shall know just as I also am known. We understand. Uh, we see Christ dimly now. We don't understand all of the nuances. It's the same as we spoke of this morning, when we spoke of uh, why there's suffering in the world, why the bad things happen to good people. Uh, we don't see everything, we don't understand everything, 
And we don't really understand Christ in His entirety yet, or at least as much as we will eventually when we go to be with Him. As it says in 1 Corinthians 13, 12, Now we see any mirror dimly, but then face to face. That's what Paul was referring to. Now I know in part, but then I shall know just as I also am known. In other words, I will know Christ as well as I know myself. And then the concluding words in this letter, again, are the same. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. That's a charge, again, for all of those who hear, and they need to heed the message of this church. Not only those at this particular church, but those at all the churches, and for us even today. And really in this letter, if I was to outline it, since we're closing it tonight, uh, I would outline it with three important truths. The first and foremost truth of this letter is it points out the danger of practicing and tolerating sin in the church. That's the first and foremost uh, uh, emphasis that's made in this letter. Uh, sin in the church causes God to judge those that are unrepentant, as He has to. You place that you, we, when we decide as a church that we will condone sin in our midst, we, we force, we force God's hand. Because God sent, the church, the church, God has a desire for purity in His church. And what is purity? Is purity 90% holy? That's not what God wants. God expects purity from His church. And whenever the church exists and with a toleration of sin, then God has to judge it. And He judges it in different ways. He judges it in different factors, all in chastening and out of love to bring the church back to Him so that it will come back and will uh, repent and confess of its sins and then get right with Him. Second, the second point I believe this letter makes is that there is a pattern of obedience that marks true Christians. By that I mean that these, the Christians, the remnants that are in each one of these churches are not your Sunday morning, fly by the seat of their pants, willy-nilly, occasional Christians. These are steadfast, diligent in the word, on their knees type Christians. These are Christians who understand what it means to walk with the Lord and understand what it means to be obedient to the Lord. And then finally, the last major point I believe of this letter to Thyatira is that God's gracious promise to His own is that in spite of the struggles that we have with sin, in spite of the errors that exist in our churches, they will, we will, if we remain faithful, experience all the fullness of Christ when we reign with Him in His kingdom. All we have to do is keep the course. Uh, in churches like this one in Thyatira, who fail to heal the, heed the message, though, they're going to receive judgment, and uh, they need to heed the message uh, because the message, the heeding of the message, uh, has with it divine blessings. See, it's not... You don't, churches don't exist in neutral. They really don't. Churches are either going forward or they're going backwards. If you don't see that forward motion or that backward motion, that's because you choose not to see it. I believe it. I believe all churches are in motion one way or the other. I don't believe, I don't believe, I believe it's the same way with our own Christian walk. We cannot maintain a neutral walk, although we might want to. God, leave me alone right now. I'm too busy doing other things. I don't have enough time right now for your holiness. I just need to do what I need to do. Leave me alone. That's not the way it works. We have to pursue our relationship with the Lord. Because I tell you one thing, the world is pursuing us. Amen. And it's pursuing us at a greater and greater speed each and every day. So here's a church that, uh, remember this church, had dissolved about 90 years after this letter was written. It had fallen aside and 
fallen, it had fallen apart because of the false teaching which uh, had been practiced there that, that it planted a seed which stayed within for quite a while. So it's my prayer uh, for us in regards to us that God will find us faithful in our desire to follow Him as He leads us on our way. So that finishes that particular letter. So we'll, uh, and if you have questions, we can address those at the end of the session. But that will take us to Sardis, and we may get almost all the way through this letter tonight. So let's let's take a look at the next uh, the next letter to the church at Sardis. John MacArthur speaks to the idea that if there was a star that was 30 light years away from Earth, and if it had exploded five years ago in our time, we would still be witnessing that light for another 25 years. Because it takes that light 30 light years get to get to us. So even if that star evaporated and there is no light emitting from it right now, for 25 years, we would continue to witness that light. That's an illustration, I believe, that kind of, uh, that MacArthur speaks, that illustrates the situation of some churches today. They still shine with a reflected light of what I would call their brilliant past. Looking at them from a distance, when you see them from the distance, you might think nothing has changed, that they're still the same uh, the same group, the same, they still have the same vitality for the Lord. Yet in reality, there is a spiritual darkness of false teaching and sinful li living that has extinguished the light on the inside. And they may still have a good, a good reputation, not unusual. But see, whenever a, ch a church tolerates sin, there's going to be a, uh, there's going to be consequences of that toleration. Uh, these churches would be those that are reputed to be alive, but the Lord Jesus Christ, here with Sardis, reports this church to be dead. The downward spiral that churches like uh, that we've seen, beginning with the church at Ephesus, which remember had lost its first love for Christ, and continued with Pergamum's worldliness, Thyatira's condoning of sin, and now we come to Sardis we reach a new low. This really, this church could be called the first church of tares. T-A-R-E-S. It was a church that in fact is dominated by sin. It's dominated by unbelief. And it's dominated by false doctrine. It's like the fig tree that Jesus spoke of where he said that the, uh, it bore many leaves. It looked good. Nice looking freight tree you got there, but it didn't have any figs. There wasn't any fruit. And uh, sadly to say, that's the way some of our churches are. This was an actual existing church in John's day. It, uh, yet it symbolizes the symptoms of many churches throughout history. And uh, sadly, even those that exist to this day. I think I know this church. I know this church very well. I think this is the church that I used to go to in Clovis, New Mexico. Uh, at one time, it had a huge ministry in the community. It had a bus ministry of over 400 kids. It has an, an auditorium that will sit a thousand people. And now it probably has 110 people that have come to church on Sunday morning that do the things the same way that they've always done them for the last 50 or 60 years. And they expect to reach a world that has completely changed and they have no idea what it means. I think I know this church. And there's a lot of churches like that around us, but don't take me wrong, recognizing what the world needs, when I say recognizing what the world needs, I, I believe I know what the world needs. The world needs the gospel of Jesus Christ. It doesn't need social programs. Witness the government. The government has social programs for everything. How has that worked out? So, but let's look at the, let's look at this church. Uh, even with a lot of these churches, even though there appears to be a light, it's only an illusion. And uh, again, I'm going to divide the, the letter into seven elements. And the first element, again, of course, is the correspondent. Jesus opens each letter by recognizing himself.
16, and here he makes an additional reference that comes out of uh, chapter 1, verse 4. He uses the phrase, uh, the seven spirits. And that phrase could refer to Isaiah 11, 2, which speaks to the Holy Spirit, as the spirit of the Lord shall rest upon him, the spirit of wisdom and understanding, the spirit of counsel and might, the spirit of knowledge and the fear of the Lord. Or it could also uh, refer to the symbolic depiction of the Holy Spirit as a lap, lamp stand with seven lamps. What do we call that? A lamp stand? With seven lamps? Yeah. From the tabernacle? You might want to call it a menorah. You call it a menorah. So uh, that would be another uh, idea in regards to that reference. But in either case, the reference is to the Spirit's fullness or its completeness, whatever you that number seven is reflective of completeness or fullness. And Jesus Christ then is represented to this church through the Holy Spirit. I think we can, we can make that assertion. And the seven stars here then would be the seven messengers or the seven elders. That would be those who were the recipients of the, uh, the letter. At each of the churches, they might be uh, those that actually carry. Uh, some people think the elders came to John and picked up the book. Each one for each church. Uh, whatever the image there is that Jesus Christ, the sovereign Lord of the church, is mediating his rule through godly leaders, through teacher preachers, through elders who function to lead the church body as they believe the Lord would have them lead the church body. Christ's introduction of himself here in this particular letter does not hint the severity of the circumstances that are to follow for the church in Sardis. In previous letters, there's been a hint by how he describes himself of what he's going to address. In the church at Thyatira, he introduced himself as the divine judge. But here he doesn't do so. Rather, here he emphasizes his sovereign works through the Spirit, and then he emphasizes godly leaders. And maybe there is a correlation there, as he is making note of what Sardis lacked. Because evidently Sardis lacked a, uh, a Holy Spirit indwelling, and they lacked leadership. Devoid of the Spirit, the church of Sardis was dead, populated primarily by the unredeemed, the letter will say, there are a few. And that, in the Greek, that means there are a few, not very many. The church itself, the next element is the church itself, and although the details in, are not recorded in Scripture of how the church was founded, it was probably founded through Paul's ministry outreach from Ephesus. He was there and planted these other churches. The most uh, prominent person known to be associated with his church is uh, Melito. He was an apologist. Remember, apologist is someone, merely someone who makes a defense in speech or writing of a certain belief. Of course, in this instance, it is the Christian faith. Uh, Melito was a bishop at Sardis in the second century, and he wrote some of the very first commentaries on the, uh, on the book of Revelation. Uh, notice this letter does not speak of persecution. This church is not being persecuted. This letter does not teach, does not speak about false doctrine. This letter does not speak to the issue of false teachers. And this letter does not speak to the issue of corrupt living. You know why? Because Satan doesn't need to mess with this church. He's got to write where he wants to. It has a great reputation in the community, and it's doing nothing for the Lord. I imagine false doctrine, false teachers, and corrupt living were present at the church, but it was dead. In a nutshell, that's the church at the, that's the church at Sardis, the city, which in many ways reflects the uh, the church. The city was founded about 1200 B.C. and is one of the greatest cities of the ancient world. It would have been capital city of the fabulously rich Lydian Empire, and the Lydian Empire was known by everyone. It had a king whose name was uh, Croesus, and it 
there was a saying, if you were as rich as Croesus, it meant that you were a very rich individual. And the city was rich because it had a river nearby it that had gold. That made it a very, very rich locale. It's believed to be the first place where they minted coins, silver, gold, and silver coins. The, silver, the city also benefited from its location. It was at the western end of a road from the Persian capital city of Susa. It was <coughs> an important trade route because of its gold. People traded with it. It had a good wool industry, garment industry, and it, uh, it made claim. You know, everybody in the ancient world wanted to be famous for something. It laid claim to being the place where wool dyeing was first invented. It was about 30 miles south of Thyatira. Not far away. These cities, none of these cities are far from each other. They're all generally 30 to 50 miles between city, within easy distance of each of, of each other. Uh, Thyatira, remember, was sat in a fertile valley that ran north and south. Uh, Sardis ran in a valley that ran east and west. And it was the city itself originally was built on a hill on a mountain. A very impressive uh, hill that on three sides had vertical stone faces. Okay? Get the picture. It's a big mountain. It's got a big hill on it. And on three sides, it's got vertical rock faces. And it made it very difficult to approach the city. There was one way to get into the city of Sardis, and that was from the south. And it, even then, it, was, it wasn't an easy path to follow. It was an ideal strategic location, especially for a city that was rich. Its only drawback was that it didn't have very much room. It was on a hill. And as it grew, it became more prosperous. There became, became the need to expand. And what happened was the city actually moved off of this rocky hill into the foot of the into to the foot of the hill, and it expanded in that area, and uh, and then the old city became the Acropolis. The Acropolis being the high place, and it's not really a high place in the traditional sense. In the traditional sense, the Acropolis or the Acropoli would be the top of a mountain, but in this instance, it was a place where they would retreat to. So it was their Acropolis as the city grew. As is normal with human nature, witness America, uh, the people became overconfident about their position in the world, that no one could defeat them because they had this great strategic location. And the Persians came and snuck up on them, and they were able to scale men, one at a time, up those steep vertical faces of the hill, and then they hid on the top in a group until they amassed enough men up there to conquer the city and kill its king. Which really means that the people in Sardis were so complacent about their own security that they didn't have any idea what was going on around them. They were just fat, dumb, and happy, for lack of a better phrase. So that was the last time that Sardis was an independent state. And it eventually, about 133 BC, came under Roman control. And uh, it was destroyed by a catastrophic earthquake at one time, but rebuilt by the Romans. And its main object of worship was uh, Sibylle. And Sibylle is the same goddess that was worshipped in Ephesus, who would we, we would know as Artemis Diana. And it had a famous hot springs not far from the city. And it was felt that uh, if uh, you went to the hot springs, this is where it, the, the belief was that this is where the gods manifested their power to give life to the dead. Manifested their power to give life to the dead. Kind of sounds like what the church is supposed to do. Jesus Christ manifests his power to give life to the dead. Because we're all dead before we come to know him. And then once we know him, we live eternally. Kind of ironic when you consider that the, the church was really the place that should have been speaking that. But in, by the time John writes this letter, Sardis has seen its better days gone by. It's begun to decay as a, as a city. 
and has lost a lot of its vitality. So the next element is the concern, and uh, it's quite a concern. In the middle of the second verse, Jesus says, I know your works, that you have a name, that you are alive, but you are dead. For I have found your works, for I have not found your works perfect before God. Notice, uh, there's no con uh, accommodation yet for this church here. Usually the accommodation comes before the concern, but in this letter it comes afterwards. We go directly to the concern. And what this says here is that there is an outward appearance that may fool some, because the text uses that phrase, you have a name that you are alive. That means they have a reputation of being alive, that people see them and think that they are alive. But, under the gaze of Jesus Christ, the omniscient gaze of, gaze of, of, of Christ, he pronounces this church being dead. He says what other people see in you is not true. And as with many churches throughout history, that have defied, that they, the world has been able to grab a hold of them. Uh, really, what you have at this church, then, listen, what you have to have at this church, you have to have a large population of people that are playing church. To be that utterly deceived. To be participants in a, in a church that is, according to Jesus, dead. They have to be playing at church. Because the spirit cannot function in that type of situation. In the New Testament, spiritual death is always connected to one thing. To its cause. And that is sin. There's no other way to look at it. Ephesians 2.1 describes the unregenerate dead in trespasses and sins. See, I think the church at Sardis was a lot like a museum. You go to the museum and you see the stuffed animals and the caricatures of people. They're exhibited in their natural habitat. Okay. Everything appears when you enter the church at Sardis. Everything appears as you enter the church door. Everything looks normal. They're playing the right music. They have a, they have a pulpit. It's got some nice words on it. They have, they have a nice looking church. But when you really look closer, if you're spirit filled, you realize one thing. It's not a lie. That's a sad commentary, but it's the truth. So what are the signs then of a church that is dying, at least from a spiritual perspective. Well, let me say this. When a church is willing to rest on its past successes, when it becomes more concerned about religious forms than spiritual realities, when it focuses on curing social ills rather than changing the hearts of people, by preaching the life-giving gospel of Jesus Christ, when a church is more concerned with what men will think than with what God has, in fact, said, when it's more enamored with creeds and systems of theology than in the Word of God, when a church loses its conviction that every word of the Bible is the word of the Almighty God Himself, those are the signs a church that is dying. And I don't care about their attendance, and I don't care about their status in the community. Such a church, according to the Word of God, is dying. Because when you deny the only source of spiritual life, which is God and His Word and His Spirit, then you, in fact, can only have one outcome, spiritual death. The congregation at Sardis, it says, was performing works. Some of your Bibles will say deeds. So they are going through the motions. They are performing things that for, they feel that they are performing works for Christ. But the
these works, because of their spiritual condition, are not found perfect before God. See, God doesn't want your works. If you're doing your works, half for Him and half for you. God doesn't want your works if you're doing your works for you. God doesn't want your works if you're doing them with any type of ulterior motive. He only wants your works when you're doing them for Him. Because of His promise. <clears throat> and because of that, this church, they are performing works. And these works, I, I believe, are still sufficient in nature to maintain its reputation in the community. It says that they have a name before men, but they are insufficient and they are unacceptable before God. See, the works of this church have been weighed on a scale of justice. And those works have been found to be wanted by Jesus Christ. I think back to the Old Testament hero Samson. Despite his, his spectacular feats, his amazing strength, his life came to a tragic and sad end. After repeated requests, he revealed to Delilah his source of strength, and she cut his hair, and he lost his strength. Not because he lost his hair. That wasn't why he lost his strength. He lost his strength because he was disobedient. But I think the most tragic part of that story isn't the loss of his strength. Even the loss of his eyesight, I think the most tragic part of the story is in Judges 16, 20, where it says, Samson, he did not know that the Lord had departed from him. In his, even in his disobedience, he failed to understand that the Lord had departed from him. He was the same man, he had the same na name, he had the same reputation, but his power was gone because the Lord was gone. And so it is with the church at Sardis, one spiritually alive, one spiritually strong. It had become blind, it had become weak, and it had not yet recognized the fact that the Lord had departed. And this is the concern that Christ has about the church at Sardis. But he follows that with accommodation. He says... Still in the midst of this dead church, it says in verse 4, there are still, still a few names. Praise the Lord. There's still a few names. I think of it as a, when you're sometimes you're driving around in the spring of the year and you look out over a field and you see those first few flowers springing up in the desert. There's still a few names at this church. There's not enough to affect the overall evaluation of the church, but Christ who is also always faith, faithful, has not forgot these that have remained faithful to him. He never forgets. He never forgets. He never will. This idea of the preservation of a faithful remnant is a frequent theme in the Scripture. Romans 11, 1 states, I say then, has God cast away his people? Certainly not. God forbid of a, a thousand times no in the Greek. For I also am an Israelite of the seed of Abraham of the tribe of Benjamin. Verse 2. God has not cast away his people whom he foreknew. Or do you not know what the scripture says of Elijah, how he pleads with God against Israel, saying, Lord, they have killed your prophets and torn down your altars. I alone men left, and they seek my life. But what does the divine response say to him? I have reserved for myself 7,000 men who have not bowed their knee to Baal. Even so then, at this present time, Paul writes, there is a remnant according to the election of grace. There's always a remnant of God's people. Even at the dead church of Sardis, God had, God had a remnant. The sincere, the humble, a few who remain separated from the worldliness of the church, a few stalks of grain among the tares. 
The description here of the remnant is quite graphic in nature. These are those who have not defiled their garments, it says. Defiled here is translated as soiled in some translations from the Greek word mununo. And mununo means to be stained or smeared or polluted. These people had not been stained by worldliness or polluted. It's a word that those people in Sardis would have very graphically understood. It's a word that they, because of the dye industry, they would have understood that word very, very well. When we read the, gar when we read the word garments, in God's word it almost always refers to personal character. You are clothed in garments that reflect your character. The character of these people here. This is a faithful remnant that will be able to come into God's presence because they had not defiled or polluted themselves. They manifested a godly character, characterized by their white garments. Specifically at the end of the fourth verse, it says, They shall walk with me in white, for they are worthy. In ancient times, white garments were worn for celebrations and for festivals. But these will be divinely pure white garments. The garments spoken of, spoken of here and in verse 5 are the same type that would be worn by Christ himself and by his holy angels. Those that have a measure of holiness and purity now will be given perfect holiness and purity in the future. However that works. We will be as perfect as we can be. This is the commendation, the commendation for the remnant at the church at Sardis. And then Jesus follows that with a command. In the command, Jesus, in the second and third verse, if we go back to look at the command, he says, because it's broken up, he says, be watchful and strengthen the things which remain that are ready to die. And then he says in the third verse, remember therefore how you have received and heard Hold fast and repent. Therefore, if you will not watch, I will come upon you as a thief, and you will not know what hour I will come upon you. See, Jesus addresses this command to the faithful remnant. He doesn't even talk to the dead church people. The faithful remnant, he expresses to them that if they want to survive in this environment, these are the things they need to do first, he says to them. He commands them, be watchful. Some translations will use the phrase, wake up. And that may be a better translation. There's no time for complacency. They can't go with the flow. What has to happen here is that the current needs to be reversed. And that's a very hard thing to do. Have you ever tried to change the the mentality of an organization to get it to go in the right direction when it's going in the exact opposite direction. It's a battle which oftentimes uh, can be very frustrating and oftentimes almost uh, time-wasting because of people's conformity to tradition. But here Christ tells them to be watchful. Get ready. Wake up. The second thing he tells them, strengthen the things which remain that are ready to die. There's some things still left that need to be strengthened. In the Greek word, the translated thing, the word that is translated as things, it comes in a neutered, it's a neutered noun. In other words, there's no feminality or masculinity to it. So it's not a reference to people. It's a reference to spiritual realities. There are spiritual realities, things which remain that are ready to die. Christ exhorting, he's exhorting these few believers at the church to, these are, these are things in the fire, in the campfire, there's some embers down there. Fan those embers and try to flame them up. Get them to flame again. And maybe you can save some of these things still in your fellowship of believers. Third, he tells the faithful they need to Remember, therefore, how you have received and heard. And you know how you do that? Well, when you want to remember who God is in your life, just go back to his word. And he will remind you. He always does.
does for me. He always, he's always there. When I seek Him, He's never hidden. He doesn't make it hard. He's always there. The truth of the gospel and the teaching of His apostles and the words that are written that are contained in our Bible aren't there to be a paperweight. They're, be, they're there to comfort us. They're there to give us peace. They're there to give us courage no matter what the circumstance. And these folks are being, know that he wants to make it reaffirmed to them that their beliefs, if they'll go back and examine the Word, uh, if they'll dwell on the truths of Christ, on sin, salvation, sanctification, it'll be as Paul wrote in 1 Timothy 6.20. They need to guard what has been entrusted to them. They have they have, they have knowledge, they have received it, they've heard it, go back to it, go back to your foundation, and let that serve you as a base for your renewal for what we would call revival. Fourth, having gone back to the truths of the scripture, then he says they need to hold fast. And I don't really care what your theology might be, but if we don't have obedient lives, we're going to fall away from our Savior and our churches are going to suffer. The main reason why the churches of America have suffered is because of the disobedience of the members of those churches. And fifth and finally, Christ tells them they need to repent. <coughs> With remorse and sorrow, the believers at this church need to confess and turn away from their sins so that they can remain close to their Lord and Savior. These are really the steps to revival. So that's the consequences of this. Uh, if they do not follow this prescription for health, then there are consequences, and the consequences are delineated here. It says, therefore, if you will not watch, I told them to watch, but if you're not going to watch, I will come upon you as a thief, and you will not know what hour I will come to you. Whenever that idea of Jesus coming as a thief is proclaimed in Scripture, the idea is that he comes in judgment. And that's the judgment that is awaiting. This isn't the second coming. This is a reference here to the Lord personally destroying this church. I think this is a warning then for any church that finds itself in the condition that the Sardis church found itself in. The only way to avoid it, this judgment is to find our way back to the spiritual life which Jesus Christ has called us to. Okay? Comments and questions? I have a question in regards to verse 5 about the continue on there, I will not blot his name out of the book of... of and I'm going to life. look at that. Do you take that to mean that he would? Well, there's evidently a name that has been written in a book of life, and he says there he'll not blot it out. So, the way I take it is... You know why he won't? Because he can't. Oh, pardon me? He can't. That's not a threat. That's the truth. Don't take it as a threat. That's the truth. But the others, he will blot out the book of life? I'll, I'll examine that all. We'll examine that whole. We haven't finished yet. We'll examine that whole, that whole phrase in there. And we'll look at the, all the references to the book of life. Because there's some in the Old Testament that says he will blot you out. Right. And that's, and that's a different book. That's a book that Moses refer, refers to, which is a book of those that are, in fact, uh, it's, it's, the book of the living. it's the book of the living, not yeah. the book of the life. It's the book that, that makes a reference to those who are, in fact, dead. And Jesus said, he that lives and believes in me and die. Two completely different books. But I'll look at it next week, Gene. It's a good question. Also, I have another question. Yes. From light. God has a big library, Gene. Yes, he does. <laughs> and that is, the, yes, I believe it. That is, you may mention to the church and tradition. Yes. And not doing, not uh, uh, providing what the world was in need of at that time. Now, tradition is not necessarily bad in my view all the time.
time. In other words, just change to change. Sometimes that change can be for the bad to come to what the world is doing. I agree. I agree with this. And I may use that, that word tradition with a large generality, but I agree with you. I believe we have to be faithful to the gospel. As long as we're faithful to the gospel, I believe that we can, we can find ourselves, you know, we have to be able, realistically. You know, I talk about the church in Clovis. They called me two and a half weeks ago. To, they, they wanted me to go back to be their pastor. And I'm calling them this week. And, and the Lord, it, it just isn't impressing me to do that. But, you know what the secret in my mind, you know, our churches are populated with people that are very, very, most of them are mature in the Lord to a great degree. Look at our church. This is a spiritually mature church that has very, very few young people. And what churches today, the modern church has to do, just as Jesus Christ did, it has to figure out how to reach out to, to those that are spiritually disenfranchised from the church. Now, in some instances, that is, that is as simple as being willing to allowing God to work as God wants to work, which means we have to give up control and we have to let him have control. You know what older elderly saints should be doing in the church? Is elderly saints in the church should be assisting the young people in how to walk with the Lord. But who are we assisting? How many people here today are under 40? <laughs> So 
so many people in this community that are hurting, that are undone. And the churches are struggling to touch those hearts. So, okay, I'll get off of that soapbox. Gene gave me the opportunity. <laughs> Since he gave me the opportunity, I took it. You're going to address that fully next week. Yes, I'm going to talk to the uh, the Book of Life. And I've, I've, I've taught on that once before. I forget when it was, but I'll, I'll teach it again. Just because I'm fascinated by the subject. So, so you know, one thing, you know, you guys like this stuff. You know, I'm fascinated by all this stuff, so I love teaching it. I teach it. You know, I'm teaching the tabernacle. I'm like four lessons ahead already because I'm so fascinated by examining what it says. It means it's so rich. So, somebody else, yes, you're right. Oh. 
He came and gave himself for them. And we're going to try to do a study on the life of Christ. Uh, I've been just given the need of materials on the life of Christ. And in that study, there's a correlation between this is who this Christ is in the gospel, and this is who this Christ is here in the Old Testament. Yes. See, he's there, and he's Everybody. here, and you know what? He's even here right now. Mm -hmm. And if we can, that's the, the, I think that's what you're saying. Yeah. I agree with you completely. They need a firm foundation. Amen. Well, you know, and the foundation they need is the foundation they used to get at home in America. Amen. Yes, but it's not there anymore because there are many times no parents. Oh, no. All that stuff's gone. But that was, that was, that's why the word was so, that's why uh, the word is so explicit how to bring up your children in God because it's so, so very important. But now we've raised several generations where that hasn't been important. And that's why we find ourselves in the condition we're in. Well, yes? They, they took God out of the schools also. Well, we used to have a blessing over the cafeteria food. But who, and who allowed them? We, we did. Uh, we did. Our parents did. We, decide, we, we let the world, uh, the lawyers, uh, ACLU, all those guys, because, because see, there was a generation of Christians that decided that to be a Christian meant to be, meant to, that you love everybody and roll over and they confront you. You have to be tolerant of every, everyone else, uh, but they don't have to be tolerant of you. That's why we really lost the We've lost a lot of battles. We'll never lose the war, but we've lost a lot of battles. And I'm kind of in a, I'm in a position now, sometimes I wonder, eh, how hard should we fight? The quicker we lose, the quicker he comes.